This is you in a high-performance passenger car. And you also in a high-performance race car. This is you behind the wheel with me, Jackie Stewart, as I take you through the insights, pleasures and thrills of driving. Ride with me as I show you how the art of driving road cars and race cars is so similar. In this hour, I'll be grouping performance driving into four main attitudes. Acceleration, cornering, braking and smoothness and dividing these further into techniques like waiting and unweighting your car suspension, stopping and wet surfaces. Everything you can do in your own car to be smoother with less effort while driving with greater skill and safety. If you have the urge to race, I'll show you how to get into that too. Not on the highway, but on the racetracks, like these where licensed entry-level drivers can discover first-hand competition and the rewards of sanctioned motor racing. I've been in motor racing for a large part of my life, and during this time, I've discovered many of the secrets of performance driving. In this theatre we call motorsport, there's a delicate balance between being in and out of control. The real challenge and joy of being behind the wheel of a race car, or for that matter, a road car, is the driver's ultimate test. The ability to control and master a motor car in motion. Before we begin, I want you to ride with me in a Ford Trans Am race car to get the feel of what we'll be doing here. So, let's drive. exhilaration and personal satisfaction I derive from it. The feeling of achievement and sheer unadulterated pleasure I experience from driving a car at the limit of its ability and my own, well, it'll live with me forever. In this video, I want to communicate what I feel about motor cars, whether it be on the road or on the track, and to allow you to understand what we should be striving for in terms of the techniques involved in performance driving. You know, it's always nice to be the best, yet it's not always possible. But it is always possible to improve your own personal performance. You probably thought I was driving this car. Well, Clearly I'm not. I'm in fact sitting in the design center here of Ford Motor Company in Detroit. This is what they call a module. It's what the designers use to decide what the interior of cars are going to look like. And I thought it might be a good idea to use this module to demonstrate how to sit in a car correctly and what position you should drive in. Now think about most anything else you do in life. Think about golf for example. If you don't have your feet planted correctly on the ground, the chances are you'll miss hit the golf ball. Well, it's exactly the same in a car. Very important to know where your feet go. Firstly, imagine yourself on the deck of a yacht in rough seas. I would have my legs apart, I would have my feet splayed, I would have one leg slightly ahead of the other, and I'd have my knees bent. Now, have a look at my driving position right now. That's exactly the same position. And why that should be is very simple. I would be able on the yacht to accommodate every roll and every pitch. And in a car, if anything were to go wrong, my feet would be firmly planted inside the car where they should be. This left leg is used as a brace. I would brace by pushing down on that footrest or wheel arch where this would be firm, pressing myself hard against the back of the seat and down into the seat itself. 
This foot would therefore be free to accommodate the accelerator pedal and the brake pedal without any forces bothering it because I would be glued to the seated position here. Now, even in a race car, we have a footrest just for that very purpose. The steering wheel itself should not be very far away. And to be sure that that is the case, clearly that comes from seat adjustment. Modern day cars are very adjustable in their seats. Not only do they go forward and back, they can go up and down. And the back of the seat itself can be reclined to a position where almost every, everyone can be accommodated. The ideal position for me is to be able to clench this fist on the steering wheel itself so that the elbow is bent. Now, there's a great fallacy that racing drivers used to lie back with their arms straight. That's certainly not the correct way to do it. Because if at any time there has to be a sudden movement, or even if the steering gets heavy, who's ever heard of anyone lifting a heavy weight with straight arms? You have to bend your arms to, in order to lift that weight. If you're able to clench that fist, keeping this elbow bent, without moving it in any way from the back, of the seat here, that is the correct position to be in. So you should be at 10 minutes to two, in my opinion. That's the most comfortable position to be in. You should be able to reach comfortably all of the controls and the dials you should see clearly. If you're in that position, I believe you're in a very strong position to control this car under almost any circumstance. Keep in mind that this steering wheel was never made as a grab handle. It was made to change the direction of the car. So brace yourself correctly and therefore allow yourself the freedom to do almost anything with the steering wheel. In performance driving, the first thing you want to understand is how any car reacts to its own engine power, putting the power on and taking it off. In more technical terms, this is referred to as transferring the weight from to rear or vice versa. When I'm looking at races like this, my mind flashes back to the designers who created these cars and the problems that they face. Let me demonstrate maybe here what I mean. When he first puts pen to paper, the object of the exercise is to have a car, if it's traveling in this direction, to have good suspension movement front and rear so that the car can accommodate all of the bumps and the undulations freely so that the car can take up a position of roll going into the corners and out of the corners. For example, I'm driving this European Ford Scorpio to show what roll is, stopping the picture here to illustrate side-to-side -side weight transfer through the car's suspension. If we consider that that car, maybe in a, a race situation like this, is approaching a right-hand bend, what will happen is that they'll put the brakes on around here, could be around about 150 miles an hour. They want to hit the apex there and they want to exit the corner there. What occurs? Well, look, this happens. He puts the brakes on. The nose of the car, because we're still traveling in that direction, goes down. And the rear end, it goes up. It, the car reaches the full limit of its suspension movement and finally it'll hit what we call the bump rubbers. Those are rubber bushes that stop the car from grinding into the road but it is the limit of the suspension movement and when that occurs there is no more suspension to accommodate the ripples or the bumps in the entry of that corner. And what can occur? Well, the car's got to turn right into this corner. The initial turn in may be okay but as soon as the car takes on any set on, there's no suspension movement, remember, the bumps will make the front wheels chatter forward. They introduce this phenomenon called understeer or push, but suddenly the rear end will kick out and get loose, bringing in oversteer or looseness in the rear end. Well, what will occur then is that the driver will try to control this by the throttle. So there's a lot of power to apply, and this occurs. We're still traveling in this direction. The back end comes down and the front end goes up. Now again, of course, this is an exaggeration. Generally, he has to back off the throttle and by doing so, this car goes on to more acrobatic moves. It's very tough on the suspension, it's very tough on the transmission, and frankly, it's very tough on the driver because he has to work very hard to do it. The way that he can avoid this is being gentle in braking and progressive in throttle application. Those are the elements of driving smoothly, with finesse.
What I'm going to show you here is how you can accelerate smoothly and gently with this car. It's got about 600 to 650 brake horsepower in it, so therefore it's not all that easy to bring that power in smoothly and gently, but it can be done. And the great racing drivers of the world, they've always done it this way. So let me try and demonstrate this to you in the most difficult sense, actually on the racetrack, when we're going to be pushing it pretty hard. So we'll fire it up. is a thrill. It makes you want to go faster from time to time, perhaps a little faster than you should. But it should be applied to balance your driving so that you can be more consistent, which will assist you in more comfortable travel and better mileage. You don't want to bog down going up those lovely Michigan hills here and have to burn more fuel to get over them with throttle to floor waste. So, the key to correct use of acceleration is to anticipate, to think ahead with intelligent use of the throttle. The essence of smooth throttle application is to be gentle with the throttle. I've got the car right now in second gear. Now, if I'm going to accelerate in second gear, I have to be very gentle and very progressive with the throttle. And when I come off the throttle, again, I have to be very slow and very gentle with it. It's like a feather touch. If I do that, the passengers in the car will not be rocked back and forward. If, on the other hand, I am too aggressive with the throttle pedal, look at this. My head goes back when I accelerate, and my head goes forward when I decelerate, all because of two abrupt movements of the throttle pedal. The essence of good driving is smoothness, and the people who will notice this most are your passengers. So just remember it again, gentle application of the throttle when you're accelerating even hard as I am now, and gentle move the foot off the accelerator pedal when you want to decelerate. You can do this every day as you're commuting to and from work. It's the essence of being able to drive with finesse. Now that we've begun our involvement with performance and before going into our next section about cornering, it's important to understand how finesse was born and cultivated in car and driver. We'll begin with the evolution of both. Here at the annual historic automobile races on the track at Laguna Sick and near Monterey, California. This is an event that brings from all over the world great racing cars and former champions, including yours truly. Here today is Jackie Stewart, three-time world champion with a record This is a place to learn what so many aficionados consider the essential heart of motorsport. Let's meet the cars and the people. Here's the great Juan Manuel Fangio, five-time world champion. And the man on the left, Luigi Canetti, who brought Ferrari to America. 
And from later years, in the same magnificent era of motor racing, this is Sterling Moss, once Fangio's teammate. Sterling's speciality was being able to drive almost any car in any kind of motor sporting event. Here in his 70s, Fangio was called the old man even 30 years ago. The classic thinking driver, shrewd at the wheel, a thorough tactician. Fangio performed his art with absolute meticulous precision. Let me guide you through the decades now to look at these earliest examples of motorsport that emerged in Europe when the eccentric blitz raced from village to village in cars like this. So high, so narrow that today people might laugh. But then they were the most modern devices available to man, the leading edge of technology. The 1908 Mercedes, chain driven by an enormous 12 litre engine, wore out tyres at a staggering rate. More supple early racers were a major step towards slimming down bulk and brute power. And the 1914 Mercedes Grand Prix car, with smaller engine displacement and live axles, brought the birth of team racing. But engineering had a way to go. A riding mechanic had to manually pump pressure into the fuel tank to keep the car running. From massive frontal areas to experimental streamlining, this 1925 Ford Raggio reflects a revolution in design. While some cars stayed heavy and large, others achieved controllability through advanced lightweight chassis, like these elegant French Bugattis. This Type 35 was the most successful racing car of its time. Created through artistic design, the Bugatti was extremely reliable. Even this 1928 supercharged version, the masterpiece racing car, had arrived. In Germany, aviation technology and considerable money helped reshape the Grand Prix car. Driven here by the great Hermann Lang, this 1937 car pushed track speeds to almost 200 miles an hour. After the war, new sports cars arrived like this 49 Porsche and Ferrari. European engineering became fashionable in America. On the world's racing circuits, cars were soon fuel injected and running fully independent suspension. Fangio here leads Sterling Moss in a display of 1950s transition. That of the Grand Prix car becoming a sports racing car. Race technology reaching the open road. In the revolution, the race driver and the road driver matured together. Always finding their peak, then improving on that. In America, a new breed of road cars like this GT4 Mustang gave the public high performance it could afford in 1963. And the Ford-powered Cobra became the sports car winner in race after race. Because of their speed and aerodynamics, it might appear that these 1970s Can-Am cars completed the evolution of the racing car. But technology continues its refining. Open-wheeled Formula Fords provide a modern training ground for Indy and Formula One racing. Young drivers cutting their teeth just as champions of decades ago. Cornering. That's the next in my four categories of performance driving. It's like a ballet when it's right. Almost poetry in motion. You have to turn the car into the corner gently. And the most important part of this corner is the entry. Don't lunge the steering wheel. Try and turn the steering wheel initially very gently and very slowly. myself drive a racing car like this, the car talks to me, it tells me whether I'm cornering the way I should be or shouldn't be. Your steering will feel light when you're doing it correctly, because the car is addressing the track at the proper angle. In other words, if it's light, it's light. When you do it wrong, the steering gets heavy, the tyres are scrubbing the track, and the whole racing car is, in effect, complaining. It's saying, if it's heavy, you're doing it wrong. So what you want to do is treat the cornering gently and don't wind the steering wheel all the way around and therefore put on what's called too much lock. Remember that finesse is the key to it all. But I've got to be gentle again and I can't apply too much lock. If I apply too much lock, the car will only understeer, that's to say push straight out. gentle on the steering wheel, it's fingers and thumbs. But if I do it the wrong way, let me show you. I'm trying to go over too quickly, and immediately I've got to start 
you hear, it's the ultimate complaint. It's saying, don't do this. There could be serious consequences. Invariably, it comes as a learning process amongst beginners in racing. Too much power, either too early or too late. The suspension and balance, the miscalculation, enthusiasm, searching for experience. And there was a time when another young driver had to pay his due. One, Jay Stewart, when his throttle stuck in a corner with no place to go but straight on. Safety belts and quick action saw me through that one. And sometimes in an instance, it can look like this. One car has grazed another, and the physics of inertia take over. Lynn St. James was driving the car that crashed and caught fire. While the other two GTP cars involved, driven by Doc Bundy and Chip Robin, took a tremendous beating, miraculously, no one was even injured in this accident. However, had it not been for seatbelts and harnesses, as well as for the energy-absorbing features of their deformable race cars, there might well have been fatalities. After being upside down with a race car on fire, Lynn St. James still walked away from a wrecked car. A very fortunate lady indeed. The penalty for error in motorsport has much more serious consequences than in most other sports. Let's have a look and see what can happen. are sinking. Cambridge are going down. That is the end of the race. There's no way now they can pick themselves up again. There they go. And now it's panic. And now we must have the rescue. We must come in for the rescue. My approach to a certain while driving this race-prepared Ford Escort at Macau caused me some embarrassment. If I hadn't been wearing my seat belt and shoulder harness, this one could have been nothing to laugh at. I made a mistake. Well, I, I, I misjudged the apex of the corner. The car went in sideways. It got into some very loose stuff. The car just turned over, did a neat roll one way, spun round it and an end over ender. And I think I might have got, if not a bronze, certainly I think I would have got a silver in the Olympics off the high board. Corner. In a race car or here in a road car, the same principles prevail. But there's one major difference when driving on a public highway like this. Road surface. Where a racetrack will be well cared for, our roads will seldom be billiard table smooth. When you go around a corner like this, for example, don't go so close to the edge of the road that you go into the potholes that sometimes do arise, just like this one here, for example. The corrosion of that road surface has caused a real hole in the road. Now you can cause yourself to have a puncture, you can cut a side wall, you could even damage a wheel by doing so. Don't do it like that. Don't use every inch of the road. Give yourself some space. Now we're going into another section here where I'm going to start having to concentrate very clearly in what I'm doing. Hitting those apex as well. Basic to any turn in the road you should be able to recognize where the apex is as well as your point of entry into that corner and your exit point out of the corner. A sketch will help me explain. On a typical corner as I'm showing you here, this is your entry point where any braking you might have to do should already be done. This is your apex where you actually make the transition from driving into the corner to driving out of it. And this point is the exit, where you leave the corner, progress on towards the next corner, and there repeat the cornering process. Entry, apex, exit. Let's make it work. Just imagine that drawing in front of you as we come into this corner. The apex is right here, and we're into another corner right away for this apex, and then the exit. You should never feel the end of a corner because you should accelerate through the turns in truly progressive fashion and be mindful of little dips or hill crests in the road ahead. These will weight and unweight your car suspension and affect your cornering. 
And remember, always leave yourself space for the unexpected. There's no point in aggressively attacking this road surface. It's not going to allow me to be any faster. I certainly am going to be more spectacular, but what's that going to prove? What's going to happen is, even if there's a mild incident, a witness is going to turn around and say, well, we heard him coming, we heard a screech of tires, we heard the brakes, we heard him changing down and shifting far too often. He must have been going far too fast. Wrong. You shouldn't have to sound like that. You should be able to drive smoothly with finesse. It's very important. Whether you drive a race car or a road car, everything should be gently done. Here is a fairly hard corner. I've gone the brakes quite hard, and now I'm changing down. But you notice I didn't change down too early. Because I don't know this road, there's no point in me changing down and anticipating the corner. I didn't even know whether it was going to go left or right. I had to wait until I saw the speed of the corner. Then I selected the correct gear. Always use fingertips when changing gear. To balance your car and not cause suspension waiting and unweighting, you have to synchronize acceleration, clutch action and shifting. You should never feel a gear change. Also, don't use your gears as brakes. Brake pads are much cheaper than transmissions. I think we shift too often. Try using one gear higher than you think you need. It takes a lot of concentration, but that's what all the fun is in driving. It's a question of being able to perform your art, and it is an art. It shouldn't be all white knuckles on the steering wheel. Never drive over your head. Always drive in such a fashion that if the, suddenly, if you get caught by surprise, you can take action where necessary. Now, let me show you what happens if you do drive over your head. Here at the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company in Akron, Ohio, I'm going to talk to you about severe driving conditions, with understeer or push being my first example. The car, if it's going too fast, wants to push straight out of this circle that I'm driving here, no matter how hard I've turned the wheel or put on more lock. Let's look at a drawing that shows this. The car's going at such a speed it tries to go straight. Turning the wheel more, the car still won't turn. The inertia-induced force called understeer. It can produce accidents, and clearly this is nothing that you would ever attempt to do on the road. We are now in the Goodyear test track, and it's a very flat VDA area, that's vehicle dynamic area, and we've got all the space in the world to play with. Let me just show you what this means. As we go around this corner, everything's working well. Suddenly we're going a little bit too fast, and the car doesn't want to go around the corner, and then I increase all the lock I can. Look, the car's going straight on almost. That is what understeer's about. Now, of course, it's giving an enormous amount of torture to the front wheel of the front outside tire. And the front outside tire wear will be incredible after a few laps around here. Let me show you one more time. We go around the corner, everything's in order. We are now entering a corner a little too fast for the car and the tires. The car starts to slip. Suddenly it's going straight on instead of going around the corner. I can increase it, but look, it doesn't make any difference. However, in a circumstance such as that, if you have the presence of mind to take off a little steering lock, it will help considerably because the tire was never designed to face the corner with the sidewall. The tire was designed to face the corner with the tire tread itself. That's what the design of the tire tread is all about, to be able to grip the road. And if you turn that tire too much like that, then the angle of attack is just not what it was intended to be. Now we're looking at understeer again. The car's still going too fast on a wet surface. Goodyear's VDA has been purposely flooded to simulate a rain condition. This only exaggerates the understeer, making it more acute, even more dangerous than before. Trying to turn, see how I've wound the steering wheel? I've put almost full lock on, and the car should go left. Now, see where the wheels are? How they're angled sharply into the circle? But the car still pushes forward. My advice, slow down. This is much too fast for safety. Next, oversteer. When the car turns into the corner or into the circle here, the front end keeps biting, but the rear end slides out. 
The driver can control that rear end by the use of the throttle, but of course it adds a tremendous amount of tire wear, and of course it's potentially dangerous. We'll go around here, and then suddenly the front end will continue to bite, and the rear end won't bite, and then I'll have to correct this skid. No, I'm into oversteer, no. Look, I've got opposite lock on, and I'm trying to correct the car, and I'm having to steer the car all the time when it does that. And if I don't do anything, look, the car spins. Now, if that had happened on the road, I would surely have been involved in a massive accident. So what happens? Eventually, the tire begins to lose adhesion at the back end. Instead of the tire tread facing the direction that the tire is traveling at, it starts to go onto the sidewall as it faces the direction that we're traveling at. So what occurs is that again, same as understeer, the tire is moving on a way that does not allow the tread to address the road surface as it's been designed. It loses its grip, it loses its adhesion, and the car begins to dirt track round that corner. I apply opposite lock, steer into the skid. Eventually, the car will probably lose adhesion completely and spin out, just as we did right there. These examples of understeer and oversteer should caution against excessive speed when cornering, especially in the wet. On the road, a great number of serious injuries and fatalities occur in wet or slippery conditions. For road drivers, the rain is tiring, often a frightening thing. For race drivers, it's a test won only by good, smooth driving. In my racing years, I always worked hard to suppress and even eliminate emotions from my whole presence when I was competing. And a feeling of buoyant satisfaction was never allowed to manifest itself. I programmed my mind to eliminate both anger and elation. What I was doing in all those races was building systems of principles of high-performance driving that would permit me, in the end, to win the prize and survive the ordeal. In racing, I never drew blood from my body. I attribute largely that to the Lord above, to my mechanics who gave me excellent preparation. I seldom had mechanical failures. And of course, I did take care. In road driving, I consider the three C's to be important. To be a conscientious driver, to concentrate, and to be considerate to other road users. It's the way I live and it's the life I recommend. This next chapter, after acceleration and cornering, is about braking. It concerns what we have to do to avoid abrupt braking that will make the car dive and therefore upset our suspension and passengers. When I apply brakes, they should be just brushed. It's really a very gentle touch. Ever so lightly, I can hardly feel the nose of the car going down. And before I go into the corner, I take the brakes off. More often than not, this Lincoln Town car would be driven by a chauffeur. I call them the real professionals of driving, if they're good. To be good, they have to be very smooth and very gentle in acceleration and in braking. More specifically, in braking. These cars are very softly sprung to be comfortable for the passengers. But if you abuse your braking and you go in too deeply with the brakes on too aggressively, the nose goes down, the tail goes up, and the passengers, they're pitched forward. The town car approaches at 30 miles an hour. It's weight and gentle suspension ready to be abused by improper braking. It dips and rocks from too much pressure in sudden application of the brake pedal. Aside from emergency stopping, this is totally unnecessary. If it is done correctly, from the same speed, 30 miles an hour, 
the car should slow down with the front end hardly dipping at all. And before the driver comes to a stop, he should be letting the brakes off so that the passengers themselves hardly notice they've come to a stop. Again at the VDA, it'll be obvious that braking on the wet is quite different and requires that you understand what water between the road surface and your tyres can do to stopping time. This is the tread on a new tyre, one that gives maximum pavement contact when braking in the wet. Next to it is a tyre so badly worn that it's in fact illegal. It has no tread channels left and will not disperse water from between it and the road surface. A certain candidate for dangerous aquaplaning. You must have good tread like this to help keep you from skidding and having an accident. To see the difference in stopping distance, the new tyres will be in the top half of the screen, the bald tyres in the bottom. The difference, a frightening 66 feet, the width of a city intersection. Now, viewed with high-speed photography through a heavy glass plate, this is the same new tyre tread making road contact in the wet, showing how rain disperses from its tread channels to keep this firm rubber-to-pavement contact with the road, reducing the chances of an out-of-control skid. Another way to reduce the chances of a skid is to pump your brakes. To see how this applies to road driving, I'm going to purposely lock up my wheels by jamming on the brakes too hard. Therefore, I slide right through the gate and the cones. By locking the wheels, the car would not change direction. Now, let's do this again. We're going to enter the coned area at the same speed. This time, I'm going to pump the brakes on and off and not allow the wheels to lock completely therefore allowing the car to change direction through its steering. I'm able to go through the gate without knocking over the cones. Now, if anybody ever argues that locking up your brakes isn't really dangerous, tell them about this. It's a story that can happen any day of the year. A light rain has fallen during the night and a young executive goes off to work again. He loves his wife and baby, and they love him. He's never had an accident, maybe never even had a traffic ticket. And to make him even more admirable, he will surely always wear his seatbelt. A perfect picture? Not quite. This one has a potentially tragic flaw. It's a common error in human conduct. The person who doesn't always concentrate on his driving and to compound the danger, he might lack that vital knowledge that he'll need to handle an unexpected situation on the road. baby was a man. The mother and driver professional stunt persons doing what they do every day for movies and television. But the situation was as real as the hard statistics that go with such a terrible scenario. What you saw here was the price of not concentrating on driving. A matter of seconds in time that might have been a terrible and lasting tragedy. Had the driver simply been alert and patted his brake pedal while stopping on this wet pavement, instead of jamming on the brakes and hopelessly locking up his wheels and trying to steer at the same time, then the woman and child would be alive right now. For the preoccupied driver, there is absolutely no substitute for concentration. So, appreciate the implications and tread a cautious path. Now, to see exactly what happened, let's look again at this accident, this time in slow motion. It began with his lack of concentration. A young executive on his way to work, he panicked and would stand on his brakes, keeping them locked instead of pumping them and possibly preventing the skid. The car would not change direction, no matter how much he turned the wheel. The driver would ask himself again, how did it happen? He locked up his brakes and therefore lost his steering. And for the 
rest of his life, this driver would recall this scene. The importance of awareness and concentration. Same as these Grand Prix drivers, you in your road car have to be mindful of all the elements of performance driving, including the traffic around you. One of the things that infuriate me about American driving is that when I come across to the States and I drive on the highway, I see a lot of people traveling at less than 55 miles an hour in the fast lane. Really, I suppose if it were me, I would rather get up to a speed that I felt comfortable and certainly never travel in the fast lane all of the time. Because if someone does want to go faster than you, even if it's sometimes beyond the speed limit, that's their problem. So move over. Be in one of the slower lanes. You don't have to be in the slow lane. Maybe one of the middle lanes. If I find myself on a fairly slow lane and traffic is passing me and I want to get up to a slightly higher speed because right now I'm only doing 50 miles an hour, don't do it with a fast and abrupt movement. It's like everything else, this question of driving with finesse. You see me move over here, changing lanes again. Even if I'm not changing lanes, I want to know what's happening up the road. So I always look through the cars in front of me, through their windows. I'll often even move over for a better view to see if there's anything that'll cause me to slow down or even stop abruptly to avoid a possible incident. If I see cars following too closely, I'd rather let them go around me. It's always a good precaution. When I change lane, I clearly don't want to do it abruptly. If I do it too abruptly, this is what happens. It just looks very bad from behind. It looks dangerous to other road users. Plus the fact everyone else around you could be involved in an incident because of your over movement of the steering wheel in such an abrupt fashion that the car really looks alarming from the outside. When I enter the highway or exit it, as I'm doing right now, I will carefully merge or change into the proper lane for my entrance or exit, always watching traffic around me, front, rear and side. It's the essence of good driving, always being as smooth as possible. I've always said there's only two ways to truly insult a person. You tell them that they're bad lovers or that they're bad drivers. Now, they'll never be convinced about either argument. No malice intended, of course, but the ball in the dish formula finesse test which I created shows how little we really know about good, smooth driving. We'll start from our standing start, then go through the figure eight and pylons, and then come back and stop on the same line we started on, keeping the ball in the dish all the time. Now, I have to start off very smoothly and progressively so that the ball doesn't jump out the dish. When I go around these corners, I've got to go in one constant arc and movement. When I change direction, it's got to be a gentle movement again. When I go into this tight corner and come back to the close to the start finishing line, I have to decelerate and gently come to a stop, keeping the ball in the dish at all times. It has to be very smooth, it has to be very gentle, with finesse. Watch the ball now. I won't be travelling very quickly. I've repeated my phrase gently and progressively a lot in this video, but these words are the most important few words of advice I would give you, other than, of course, drive safely. To be gentle and progressive in everything you do is to find what smoothness in driving really is. Look there now. I've kept the ball in the dish. So what happens when you're harsh and aggressive with your driving? Purposely abusing this ball in the dish now will make my point very clearly. A quick start rolled the ball right out of the dish. A poor turn out of the dish again. An abrupt stop will prove it once more. But there's really no way to fool my formula finesse test. When I drive for pleasure, such as here at my home near Geneva, I always take with me all the principles of better driving whether they pertain more to road cars or to racing cars. It doesn't matter. I live by these principles, and I drive by them. 
My wife Helen and I don't very often get the opportunity to drive sort of socially because the lifestyle of Jackie Stewart on the go keeps me traveling 12 months of the year as a television broadcaster and as a consultant on engineering and safety. Today in my office, I'm reviewing a safety film I've been working on, part of a worldwide program I've pursued ever since my racing years. In the United States. These pictures are all too graphic of what can happen inside a car during a collision. Be aware of the dangers to yourself and your family members riding in a car without buckling in. It's unnecessary to tell a racing driver to wear seat belts. They all do. I've always worn them in cars, both on the road and on the track. In one of the most spectacular accidents that I've ever seen at Indy, Tom Sneaver remarkably escaped with relatively light injuries from this crash. Then, in the first corner of the first lap of the Monaco Grand Prix, Derek Daly and his Tyrrell was fortunately strapped firmly into his car and walked away with no ill effects after leapfrogging a good part of the field. Stock car racing has produced some extraordinary escapes. Maynard Troy amazingly survived this one to tell the tale again. He was wearing his seatbelts. What you are seeing here is perhaps the best example of how serious injury can be avoided, even though, as you will recognize, Gary Gray is being bounced about in the cockpit of his car in a severe manner. He was wearing a full harness belt system. But as this slow motion action shows, his body seems at times to be almost elastic. In the end, his crash helmet even came off. Now when accidents do occur, such as this, where a dummy is unrestrained in a crash test, look what happens. On the other hand, where the dummy is wearing the seatbelt, you can see it never reaches the windshield or the dashboard, and therefore gets saved from serious injury and perhaps death. So what is the message? If race drivers wear their seatbelts, and a lot of the rest of the world wear seatbelts, why don't you? It's early morning, and we're in rural America. We're not going to a big time event. We're going to a motor race though. The SCCA, Sports Car Club of America, are running one of their national and regional road races here. There will be small sedans, not very fast. There will be some fairly fast sports cars and GT cars. A right mix of road racing participants. It's in a way where teeth are cut through Americans' motorsporting program. Always good racing. It's not a spectator event, it's really a participant's event. And all of them, do they enjoy it? How many years have you been racing? Oh, off and on since 67. Uh, how old are you? 46. Almost 47. <laughs> In fact, on the back of his car, he has grandpa. Grandpa in a car, eh? <laughs> Grandpa and Carr is a veteran enthusiast from Hartford, Connecticut, one Peter Pierce, financing his weekend racing on a shoestring, held together by a pit crew of family representing four generations. What I got out of my racing is essentially the same stuff Peter gets out of his, the spirit of a competition racing car and sweet adoration of the crowd. The crowd here is his family cheering on Grandpa. But after running in front, Peter Pears leaves himself too wide approaching the high side of confusion at an apex, and he finds there's no place to go but to join the tangle. If one of my sons were going into racing, I'd tell him the best place to begin is in light sedans with roll bar cages and lots of metal protection against the penalty of mistakes. The next step might be into sports cars like these, or into the best of all for beginners in open wheel cars, Formula Ford. Also in their SCCA section, there's bigger and even faster Formula cars. An excellent step up to perhaps more demanding competition would be Trans Am racing in very fast close cars like these. For the more experienced, there's the over 200 mile an hour racing of NASCAR Grand National Stocks. 
All these sanctioned by IMSA, GT cars that run at over 240 miles an hour in long straightaways. For the drivers who don't mind shaking their bones and eating a goodly amount of dust, there's organised off-road racing. Then, of course, there's the straightest and certainly the quickest of them all, professional drag racing. From car to new sack comes the American dream, a glory road that can lead to maybe winning the Indianapolis 500. With a long season of races covering four continents, here is Formula One, the FIA series that each year decides the driver's world championship. All these categories are open to the driver with enough talent and will to win, from club racing to these Grand Prix cars on the streets of Detroit. This is the world of motor racing. That world we just saw there starts here at Lime Rock and at other places like it, where the weekend racer with car trunk or van packed with tools and spare parts either passes time or works at hopefully shaping some kind of future in motor racing. Meet one of the latter with me. A promising young driver named Wright Hugus the third. My second full season, but uh, I've been racing for four summers now. What did you start at? Uh, Formula Fords. I got my national license at the youngest age ever of any American. What kind of clean nose of you? <laughs> well, I've had my fair share of shunts. Uh, I've been off the track a few times. I think that comes with driving. You know, you need to learn your limit here and there. Driving white car number 18, Hugus is racer for Formula Fords, more sophisticated than Grandpa's Formula V. Adjustable suspension cars, built like scaled-down Grand Prix Formula 1s. Hugus has been quick in practice in qualifying and has the pole. In their warm-up, drivers weave their cars, making friction with the track to heat up cold tyres for better adhesion. These are special race tyres. You never need to do this. It's never necessary or safe in a road car. Number 22 passes right Hugus, but then will experience oversteer, while Hugus takes the opportunity and passes him back on the inside. Young right Hugus obviously is driving to his limit, maybe even beyond it. Closing on a sharp right-hander, he still has too much speed on. He'll go into considerable roll and even some understeer and shoot straight off the track onto the grass. But he's okay, and will finish the race with that extra knowledge sometimes only doing can give. Climbing the ladder from Wright Hugus's class, these are the more powerful and faster GT cars, made popular by the fact they look more like our own road cars, and they're largely driven by older, more experienced drivers. Actor Paul Newman, now in his 60s, is driving this number 33 that takes the lead right at the start. Newman's teammate, Jim Fitzgerald, about the same age, is running a close second. With this many cars in one corner at a regional race, there's always someone acting spectacular who either spins out or causes someone else to. They're not going very far or very fast. As the GT race continues, Paul Newman moves through traffic, lapping the slower cars with a smoothness that many younger drivers could learn from. It's often the kind of talent that improves with age, as it did with drivers like Foyt and Petty, and of course, with Juan Manuel Fangio. I talked about this with Lime Rock's general manager, Jim Shane. The fact that today Paul Newman was one at over 60 and his teammate Jim Fitzgerald was six. This is club racing. This is where people who just want to come out and have a chance to race can do it. And they're all ages. There's young guys that want to go into it as a career and are starting. And there's older people that have been around for a long time and just enjoy coming out for the day. Well, I think the lesson is uh, I myself didn't start driving racing cars until I was 23 years of age. You don't have to start when you're 14 or 17. It's a question of being able to learn from your errors and, of course, being able to live through those errors so that you can accumulate experience. The road car and the racing car are virtually the same age, about 100 years of age. The early days of the motor car were very primitive, but the acceleration of knowledge was soon to come. Motorsport has played an important part in the evolution of the car. I see it as a gymnasium for talent, for young engineers to exercise them, to try new things, go over new thresholds of technical expertise. 
We saw it at Laguna Seca with some of the very old cars. We see it today with some of the exotica, even at this racetrack. And think of what's in the drawing boards for the future. Think how exciting it was for these men in their horseless carriages, right at the turn of the century, sitting high in their cars and seeing the world flash by at what they thought to be ridiculous speeds. For us today, it's still an enormous thrill to be able to drive a car. Thanks for being behind the wheel with me. And remember, Jackie Stewart's final advice is be a better driver and you'll be a safer driver. And always be sure to buckle up. The strange and wonderful automobile, an invention that immediately captured our imagination and continues to change our world. Early on, Hollywood cast the automobile as a comedic device, but that role never kept the general public from embracing the automobile. If we are indeed known by the company we keep, and our car is constant company, we reason that what we drive is part of who we are. Contrary to the Hollywood mogul's stereotyping, advertising recognized this emotional involvement at the outset. And today's sales strategy is built on the same platform, presenting the car as an extension of one's personality, an alter ego, a romantic notion molded in glass and steel. But for once, reality may actually outstrip Madison Avenue. In the fascinating field of classic cars, we see a level of pure joy and devotion difficult to explain. Below, concealed within this trailer, one such car has been rescued from the ravages of time and is being motored towards its new destiny, restoration. But just how are people drawn into the romance of restoration? What kind of vision enables the car lover to look through the years of grime to see the restoration possibility underneath? Why do members of America's several thousand antique and classic car clubs lavish attention on Grams, Cords, Dusenbergs, and dozens of other makes and models which the world has otherwise left behind? A visit to White Post Restorations in White Post, Virginia, widely regarded as one of the top restoration shops in the world, provides some insights into the classic car phenomenon. Consider the story of Mr. Charles Benn. In uh, about 85, 1985, I decided that I would start looking around for a 59 Basilica. Mr. Benn remembers why 1959 means so much. 
I happened to be going with a certain young lady at the time, and she kind of liked this car also. Of course, I kid her in telling her that the only reason she married me was because of the day going automobile. It wasn't me, you know. Now this car has come to White Post for restoration, with the hopes of bringing a piece of fondly remembered past into the present, and in turn, rekindling a romance. One man, one car. And while the cast of characters changes, many enthusiasts will tell a tale of memories made in one special car. Yet there are many for whom the attraction goes far beyond any single make or model. Inspired by a natural affinity for machinery, the love of work well done and an appreciation of history are the classic car connoisseurs. <laughs> I personally enjoy working on the brass era cars, which are mainly pre-World War I. I appreciate the explosion of technology that was taking place at the time. Another thing I enjoy about this period of history is sort of like chasing ghosts. I enjoy meeting the people who built these cars. A unique thing about this Durier is the fact that Mr. Durier, in designing this car, apparently had to do it differently than the other auto makers of the period. He apparently was That's not a, a contrary thing. person. <laughs> <laughs> Documentation on many of the early cars is not hard to come by. The Hupmobile can be documented very well because of the sheer numbers of cars they turned out. It was a production car. They turned out a lot of them. A lot of them still exist. It's not hard to compare cars. Some details you can pick out right away. Types of bolts. They, the uh, SAE changed bolt specs at a certain point in history. And you know that if it has a low head, doesn't have a nice crown on it, then it's a modern bolt. If it's got markings on it, grade markings, it's a modern bolt. Uh, among the metals that they did use, they used a lot of brass, especially for parts that had to be stamped or spun, although they used aluminum, they used cast iron, they had some pretty good grades of steel, although people look back and say they didn't have the metallurgy, but they sure did. Steel, leather, wood, glass, fabric, and paint. If ever there were a shining example of the phrase more than the sum of its parts, it is this 1926 Rolls-Royce, restored to showroom condition. As if by magic, all of the separate elements have been reassembled into the vanguard of grace, style, and power. Those who contribute their abilities to such pursuits will tell you that the magic is in the method. The 1926 Rolls-Royce we recently completed it took somewhere over 5,000 hours. Uh, people don't realize in a restoration of this type that there are many, many parts involved that have to be taken apart and cleaned and polished and painted or whatever has to be done. Some of the interesting details on a, a car like this are darker dipper lights where the headlights actually move up and down. Leather-covered gaiters, it's an often overlooked detail. This particular Rolls has a body by Barker. Barker was a coach builder, and when you bought a Rolls, you just bought the chassis. And you went to whatever coach builder you wanted to, most of them previous carriage builders, to have the body built. People with an itch for restoration work of this quality soon learn that it is not a hurry-up enterprise, and that there is no easy formula for estimating the cost. Frame up restoration. The process begins by photographing the unrestored car. The body is removed from the frame and the car is dismantled down to individual screws before the work of repair, replacement, and reconstruction begin. Here, Paul Rose directs the reassembly of a 1961 Mercedes 300 SL. It is impractical to give an estimate on restoring a frame up restoration. Until you take the car apart, and firsthand know what's going on inside. You have no idea what's underneath the carpet, the paint, 
you could strip the paint off the car and find that someone else has been there, been there before you with coat hangers, cardboard, wire screen, and God knows what else in the car. The 300SL that I'm presently restoring was repaired once at the factory, and like any other body shop, they were there to make money and get the car in and get the car out, and repairs just weren't up to our standards here, so we had to make everything right again, so it makes the job very difficult when you strip a car down and find the damage from years gone by uh, underneath the cosmetic repair of someone else. Metal working. Reconstructing the frame and body of the automobile combines tools and techniques from earlier times with current technology. And the metal worker must be proficient with them all, from the antique Pettengill hammer to the modern plasma cutter. The challenge to me as, as a metal man is to take what is given me, what's in front of me, that was done years and years ago, and to drop myself back into that era and then take it from there through the restoration process. Uh, a good example is the, the body seams, how the seams were formed in, in pieces and then seamed together and welded together to form the finished product, say a fender or even bumpers. It's intriguing to see how different craftsmen would approach the same job. Like the left side will be externally the same as the right side except if you look at the back side, they'll, they'll be done by different craftsmen and they'll be pieced together differently. And it's very interesting to see that and that's the fun part for me is to, to go back in time and visualize or try to visualize what they've done and how they went about doing it and to duplicate that. And that's, the, that's a challenge. Older automobiles often included wooden frame and body components. That which time and the elements work in concert to destroy, the woodworker must recreate. Consider the challenge confronting woodworker Donnie Carver. Reconstructing one car at a time, no two cars of the same make within months of one another, means that each piece is unique. A production run of one requiring its own jigs and machine settings. And even in a well-equipped shop, technology will never match the craftsman's feel for the wood, his sense of how to work each piece into exactly the right form. As the pieces take shape and are assembled, the skill of the woodworker becomes transparent. We see only the seamless beauty of the finished car. When technology has developed superior materials, authenticity is balanced with common sense. Preparing to paint, painting, and finishing demands this carefully considered approach. Of course, you start with bare metal, and then you put one or two coats of epoxy primer on the bare metal. Successive layers are applied until you uh, arrive at a smooth surface. Sanding and priming and sanding in between coats and that's how the imperfections are uh, eliminated. The leading process, I guess, goes back to the beginning of automobile manufacture or before. Uh, it's, it's a process by which uh, molten lead or semi-molten lead is applied to uh, the, the seam and smoothed out with a, uh, called a solder paddle. And of course, as it cools, it uh, hardens, and then it's filed down to the, match the original contours of the, the part that you're working on. One of the reasons uh, that uh, a restoration paint job looks so much better is because of the undercoats, sanded between coats and uh, block sanded. That's why the final finish looks so smooth. For comfort and beauty, supple leather and rich wool, the classic materials of trim and upholstery remain unsurpassed. Mastery over these materials combined with ingenuity and skilled hands are vital to a successful restoration. The right approach, the right materials, and the right skills. Essential for show quality restorations. Are they sufficient to guarantee that every part of every car is sound and authentic?
human performance and motivation are critical factors here. To produce top quality work without exception, the working environment is the key. To do this level of restoration, first of all, a mechanic has to care about his work. And second, he has to be given the time and place to do the work. I consider myself lucky to be in an environment where I can do my very best. It's very important in the restoration business today and restoring antique and classic cars to surround yourself with people that really care about what they do. I provide a facility and equipment for our people to restore these cars and it's very important that they're allowed to have the time to do good quality work. After working with a car closely and being involved with a car and you're a mechanic and you've maybe you've spent a year or two restoring a big classic car and, and the car gets near finished and it's time to go home and, and uh, you get a little sad when you see a car go home after you've worked with it a year or two but you can always look forward and, and find uh, that there's another one coming in right behind that one. Paul Rose applies finishing touches to the restored DeSoto. When a customer brings a car in, you get the feeling that he wants his car as soon as possible. But as the customer sees the car undergoing the frame-up restoration, you get the feeling that he's enthused about it to the point where he wants to, for it to last as long as possible. And then when it's all over and the car is all reassembled, test-driven, and given back to the customer, it's kind of sad because you, you work for a man or a woman for a year, you get to know them pretty well, and then they're going out of the parking lot, you've moved on to another project and started all over again. And it feels kind of weird just going from one car to a totally different kind of car. At the end, I kind of imagine and it's sad for the owner too. Because I think it's been fun for them along the way. As with all truly sustaining interests, classic car restoration and ownership can be appreciated on a number of levels. For most, whatever may have sparked their initial interest, the richest rewards come from the opportunity to share that interest with others. The National DeSoto Club Show. Cars will be scrutinized for authenticity and will reflect the personalities of their owners, trigger memories, and provide a background for relaxed companionship. These enthusiasts will see one another again, and again they will enjoy one another's company, telling and retelling stories over the hood of their favorite car. With the passing of time, the age parameters delineating what constitutes a restorable classic car move forward. And so, continually, collectors comb the countryside, peering into old barns and carriage houses for lost and forgotten treasure. The rare find takes on the character of the prodigal son's return. A deal is struck, and the sleeping beauty is trailered and transported toward rebirth. Cars of yesteryear have been displaced from their original roles. Whether they were state-of-the-art, the fastest, practical family transportation, or the latest mechanical novelty. Yet restoration gives them new life with new purpose. Through great and careful effort, a piece of history, both technological and personal, is preserved. And we are rewarded with a glimpse of days presumed to be gone forever.
Their restored status is not altogether different from our hopes for ourselves as we grow older. To be appreciated and cared for in graceful retirement. Thank you for your interest in classic cars and in White Post restorations. We invite you to visit our shop in White Post, Virginia and to call or write with your questions and comments.